Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Plants During the Pandemic, the first ever virtual program of the Garden Club of Jacksonville. We're so happy to have you all here today. I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Denise Reagan. I'm the Executive Director of the Garden Club of Jacksonville, and I'm here with Damian Lamar Robinson, our Operations Manager. And we couldn't be here without the help of the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, who is supporting these virtual programs of the Garden Club of Jacksonville. And we are so happy to have their support. I'd like to introduce Meg Gaffney Cook. Meg is the Principal Landscape Architect for Blue Leaf Landscape. Her expertise includes landscape architectural design development and project management of residential, commercial, multifamily, mixed use, government, institutional, transportation, and amenity-based projects throughout the state. She specializes in horticulture, resilience, niche, and historical design. Meg has been a resident of Jacksonville, Florida since 2002 and always an active member in her community. She was instrumental in the founding of the Jacksonville Arboretum and Gardens as the board chair during its opening. She has also been a board member of Greenscape of Jacksonville, leading many volunteer urban tree planting efforts and has helped to manage local community gardens. In her spare time, she is most often with her husband, two children, and dog, exploring, gardening, cooking, or volunteering in her community. I'm so happy to have Meg here today, and she'll be taking questions throughout the program. Uh, just put them in the chat, and uh, Damien will help us by queuing them up and uh, asking her along the way. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here talking to you about gardening during COVID-19. So many of us gardeners are even more inspired right now to get out and do what we do, the thing that relaxes us. Today, we're going to be talking about the why of gardening, the what, and the how. Do we have, uh... right, so we already have them in the poll. Oh, that's we... right. Uh, no, sorry, we do have a poll, but it's later. So first, you're going to tell us why we should garden. Right, bear with us, this is our first go. <laughs> so you're, you should be seeing a, some information from stress.org, which is from the National Institute of Stress, which has some great information about the things, the really tangible things that are good for our health about gardening. So when we are out doing what we do, we're burning calories, we're getting exercise, of course that's good for us. One thing we not, might not think about is that when we are putting our hands in the soil, we are exposing ourselves to beneficial bacteria. And that is really good for our immune system. It's just an interesting fact that I was, I love talking about. When we're in the sun, we're getting vitamin D. This boosts our, our immune system as well. When we are gardening, it's very creative. I always feel creative. It led me to my profession. And that lowers cortisol levels. It's measurable. And cortisol is our stress hormone. When that is reduced, we have uh, released tension on our brain and our heart. We can focus and just enjoy life. It, Im it improves our, we have a more satisfying experience of life. And you should be seeing our, our lady with the beer. <laughs> Some of us might be enjoying later. Or even now. Or even now. It is that time of day. So as we talked about, I will be taking questions throughout my walk around my landscape. You're in my front yard. I may be a landscape architect, but I do that because I'm a gardener first. As, I, as Denise mentioned, I studied horticulture and landscape architecture. So my home landscape is... It's my laboratory, it's my work in progress. We've been in our home here for three years, so you're gonna see the beginnings of a lot of things. I hope you'll enjoy checking it out with me. First thing I wanna show you are some of the tools that I consider hey, basic. Meg, and, before we get started, yeah. um, we might wanna take a poll about um, what your motivation is for gardening. Excellent, 
let's talk about our motivation. Take that poll and Damien will let us know where we stand. All right, so we're going to share our second poll about what your motivation might be for gardening. Pick all that apply. Yeah, we're really interested to see what everybody's motivation is. And if something, if your answer is other, be sure to put it in the chat so we know what your motivation is if it's not listed. Got a good wide selection of answers still coming in. We're about halfway there. <laughs> well, Liz, all the, Liz says all of the above. Liz Cruz, that's awesome. <laughs> all right, let's see. We've got about 78% have voted. Oh, we have jumped up to 81. All right, I think we're gonna close it out here and share the results. Damien, tell us how everybody voted. Well, wow. I mean, 78% of, of, of our attendees tonight obviously want more beauty in their garden. So creating more beauty is really important. In addition, bringing wildlife to their homes, about 59% of the people said that. And um, curb appeal, and, and feeding their family and, and, and others in the community is like half and half, right at 44%. We have a few people in the chat that also, Kate says that she wants to create a sanctuary of peace, privacy, and plenty, uh, with plenty of flowers and wildlife. And Joshua also wants to improve the environment. Cindy wants to help with continued learning. And Rebecca has a lot of time on her hands, so that's why she's gardening. Well, that's excellent. Those are great reasons. We're going to talk about them all. I know someone mentioned that those all four were motivations for them, and that certainly is the case with me. So to begin, and I'll let you know, as I walk through my landscape, I'll be talking about why I'm doing that particular thing and also how I acquired most of these plants. Uh, that will help inform maybe how you can go about getting plants for your next project. To begin with, because we're gardeners and I'm introducing myself to you as a gardener, I have to show you my basics, my favorite tools that I have to have. So this is something that not everybody uses, but instead of a trowel, this is a small hand hoe, I guess you'd say. I picked one up from Lowe's and it has a nice weight and I use it for weeding and digging. So this is a favorite of mine. Of course, a watering wand for all those new plants and a good pair of gloves. Something else that I've had for probably the last 30 years is this belt. So when I'm gardening, I have my Felco saw, my Felco pruners, a nice pair of floral shears and a weeding trowel. You're ready for anything, aren't you, Beck? <laughs> I try to be. So let's start with food. That was my first motivation when we had social distancing became kind of a standard that we all needed to follow. My home, which is my office, became also my husband's office and my children's school. My family was forefront in my mind, and I thought, I really want to make sure I can feed them, something that I felt like I could control. I had just begun to plant this garden behind me, and I'll show you. This is a harvest from this morning. So in about two months, about as long as we've been cooped up, I've gone from planting seed, which came from a local garden center and from mail order, to having a harvest. We'll be having this for dinner. Behind me, you'll see a few things from my winter garden I had to keep. This is parsley that I let go to seed. I know a lot of people let dill, parsley, uh, greens go to flower because the butterflies just love it. We'll, you'll see caterpillars and the butterflies themselves feeding on this plant, so I have to keep it. I 
I was lucky when we bought the house, there were fruit trees. So I have grapefruit, lemon, uh, lime. In front of me is the garden that I turn over, usually twice a year. The tomatoes came from Ace uh, Hall's Nursery. And again, my seeded plants, as you can see, came from local garden center and mail order. And I have to see if we have some squash in here to show you. Very nice. But even though I had just planted this garden, my instinct was to do more. You're about to see my very large front yard, which is because I'm on a corner, there were no trees. And the first thing I thought to myself in my imagination was I could dig it up and plant corn. But I thought better of that because my neighbors wouldn't be very pleased and I didn't have the time or energy to do that. I was beginning to homeschool my children. So I thought about the next phase of my land plans. You're about to see a wildlife, uh, wildflower border that was just planted this year. My plan was in the fall to plant it about a five foot tall mixed evergreen border in this location. Because I'm on a corner, lights run across the front of my home at night. And so this was the next aesthetic and functional landscape plan I had. Well, what I realized was I could plant some running vegetables. I have honeydew melon, acorn squash, and butternut squash in these small hills. And they will fill up this entire area. And this fall when I'm harvesting, I should be able to pull this up and have hopefully reduced some of the sod that I'm working with when I go to plant my, my woody plants. Now, these were seeded in and behind are some blueberries as well. Those both came from Standard Feed, which is out uh, on King Street. They have a great garden center there as they sound. They'll have, they have chickens and they have pet food and bird food and they are currently delivering. You call them up, pay over the phone and they will drop it by the next time they have somebody in your area. Very convenient. So the next thing on my personal list after yeah. food. Oh, sure. We do have a couple of questions. Damien, you want to cue this up? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Meg, can we, before, while we're taking those questions, can you zoom in a little bit and we uh, take a look at those, uh, those, those newly planted seedlets that you put in from Standard Seed? Um, sure. One of the questions that we got earlier was- Can we get was, a little closer look? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So Anne from Gainesville is starting uh, an herb garden in a raised bed and she wants to know if you have any suggestions or tips for her. An herb garden in a raised bed. Well, you can do a lot with that because you have great drainage and a lot of herbs that we typically like to use, thyme, rosemary, tarragon, lavender, those all require really great drainage and some, some decent loam to the soil. So I'd, I'd recommend starting with those. Some of the annual herbs that do well here for summer, uh, basil, and for winter, cilantro and parsley do very well as well. Awesome, awesome, thank you. One other question, now you earlier you showed us um, some fruits or vegetables that you harvested this morning. Um, what do you plan on cooking with those delicious vegetables? I love to grill. Ooh, and okay. I'm, the, I'm the unusual vegetarian who loves to grill. So fresh produce from the garden is amazingly good, just buttered, thrown on the grill, and served up with whatever else, or sometimes just on its own. One thing I didn't point out is I have a section of okra in my garden, and that's, not many people enjoy okra, but it is one of my favorite vegetables, and amazingly enough, when I butter and grill okra, my kids fight over it, so. 
What time should I come I over? Like to cook. <laughs> Okay, the the store. Someone is asking the question. Rebecca wants to know the name of the store again. It was Standard Feed and Seed on King yeah. Street in uh, in the downtown Jacksonville area. Um, we got a couple questions in reference to pesticides. The um, what's the envir What can you environmentally spray to keep the bugs away while from eating the fruits and vegetables that you've harvested there? Well, that's not really my area of expertise, and I try to plant more than I need so that I can have a little bit of loss to the insects. There are a few things, um, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is actually uh, a living organism that you can get and spray that caterpillars, if they eat it, it kills them. So it's good for some of the caterpillars that get into the garden and really kind of take a big chunk out of things. Uh, and otherwise, I might do some diatomaceous earth Strangely enough, and maybe somebody out there can comment and explain this to me, this year I am having roly polies just come up oh, at night and I can, eat. I, it's, it's really <laughs> interesting you say that. I literally <laughs> just read an article where they, um, and I forgot the actual, the proper name of them, but roly polies, they are really, really good. So if you see them in your soil, that means your soil is rich in nutrient, uh, which well, is fantastic. Good. So that's a good thing. Do you yeah, know for some what? reason, they're doing some damage this year. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're probably very hungry. Do you, um, a couple other questions. We can take a couple more. Um, pill bugs is what they're, thank you, Joshua. Pill bugs, that's what they're called. Pill bugs, AKA roly polies. We also have Thanks. a question in reference to herbs that attract butterflies. Do you know of any? Herbs that attract butterflies. Hmm. Well, if you're saying herb in terms of a culinary plant, maybe something like the, uh, the dill and the parsley that was let go to seed that I showed you before. If you use that term a little more broadly, herbaceous plants, of course there's, there are so many. And then actually that kind of leads me into my next section where from food, we can talk about wildlife. A lot of us want to bring wildlife into our gardens. Awesome. I have one last question from Nancy Powell. Do we? Um, she's asking, how can we keep the weeds away without pesticides? Weeds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, when I started my garden, and now how I start most new areas of my, my landscape, is with cardboard boxes. I plan at least a season ahead to put down cardboard boxes and a good layer of compost and then maybe even black plastic for at least four months and then plant directly into that. And that takes care of most things. You will have a problem with my, my nemesis here is a torpedo grass and nuts edge. And because I have pollinators and vegetable garden, I just about once a year, at least get in there mechanically and, and go at it with my hands and my, my nice digging tool I showed you. That's good. So Thank what do you, you have in front of you, Meg? What's that? What do you have in front of you? So this is my brand new pollinator border. It went in this year uh, in the fall. I did the cardboard and mulch over it, some hardwood mulch that I had from some tree trimmings that I had dropped off. It contains almost exclusively native plants. I have, this is a native bee balm. I have, it'll be blooming purple very soon. The spiderwort has just finished blooming. It, it has daily flowers, so usually by three o'clock, it isn't the beautiful indigo blue that I see in the morning. This is the blanket flower you'll see in the dunes here. Uh, I have a muley grass, which is also a native dune plant. My, my landscape is fairly high, dry, and alkaline, so I, I can use a lot of those uh, kind of beach-friendly plants. Beautiful. Do we have any questions about the border specifically, or I'll continue? Yeah, go, go for it. 
Yeah. Okay. So when you're planning for wildlife, obviously I've gone for pollinators right away, but I'm very interested in having birds in my landscape as well, which is part of the evergreen mixed planting that I'm going to do behind here because birds want cover and not particularly at your front door. You know, having spaces away that aren't so busy with human interaction are best for wildlife. Water is also a very good thing and I'll we'll walk up. Hey, while you're walking, I want to give you a, sh a yeah. shout out to your husband who is your uh, camera operator today. <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you very much, Bruce. <laughs> I'll point out behind me the, the live oaks that are here. They came from the, uh, I want to say Murray Hill, but the Riverside Avondale preservation planting that they did in conjunction with Greenscape in the city, where they used the tree mitigation fund that the city has to plant in public right-of-ways. And most of my front landscape is public right-of-way, so uh, I was able to get these two beautiful oak trees from that effort. That's a really good uh, point that people should know about that uh, find out what's um, public space in your yard and whether uh, you can be a part of that. Mm -hmm. This is my water source currently. I have to clean it out every day. Uh, it's not plumbed, but it has this great little solar water fountain, which really attracts birds. And it's wonderful in the morning to see all the different birds that are coming through the yard just to have a little water, especially when it's dry like it is right now. So from wildlife, we're thinking about beauty. I know so many people mentioned that adding beauty to their landscape was the thing that was motivating them. And my, uh, mo most of my friends had the same thing to tell me. As soon as they found out they needed to stay home, work at home, be with their family, they wanted a little area at least, it was just beautiful that they could look out their window and see some flowering plants or some great textures, maybe in an area that they had been neglecting for a while. But adding beauty to our landscape is just, it's very satisfying. It touches on that creativity, which we know lowers cortisol levels. So it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. My front beds are where I play with plants that are just some things that I love. I have boxwood, which I'm, I like to, I have a lot of different ways that I acquire plants, and it's kind of a fun thing for me. These boxwoods were thrown away from the top of black sheep when they were renovating their landscape. They were half dead in a pile, and I brought them home and have been babying them. So they're small right now, but in a year or two, they're going to grow together and look great. Behind me is another one of my favorite plants, white ginger. It is something that used to be easy to find. It has an amazing fragrance, especially in the evening, like most white flowering plants. But last year when I did this planting, I could not find any. So I just kept asking around until I found a friend who had an area behind her home that was kind of low and someone must have had it in the past. This plant loves wet and she had a small field of it. So I was able to just go dig a little bit and bring it home. When I mentioned asking around, uh, there are so many chat boards that are geared towards gardening. I know I used Nextdoor for my local area and have really connected with a number of gardeners through that source. I'll when my bee balm finishes blooming and the seed heads are dry and I've collected what I want, sometimes I'll put a note up there to encourage people to come by and get some seed. And uh, conversely, I end up being offered plants as well. So it's a great way to interact with your community and, and get a few things that are hard to find. Hey Meg, back to that white ginger. Um, do you, what type of fertilizer or, or uh, how often do you water the white ginger? the comment that it's not blooming as it should. Well, it's just starting to bloom. It's very much a summer plant. And actually we're lucky that the winter was pretty mild or it might be even, it wouldn't be this far along right now. If we have a hard freeze, it will go down, but it didn't this year. 
I don't tend to fertilize very much in the front. I might do a little bit of organic evergreen fertilizer once or twice a year, and I, I tend to go to the Estoma products. I use, the, they have great organic line that uh, is specific to evergreens, vegetables, flowers, especially my citrus, which citrus is a very heavy feeder, and those trees, in order to keep them happy on my sandy kind of upland site, uh, I have to use a lot of fertilizer, so I feel good about using uh, the Espoma organic citrus fertilizer. And these beds, in reference to the wet, I have downspouts that come into these beds in the front, so wet plants do very well. I'll show you a this papyrus that was here when we bought the house, which is really lovely. And you can see it's right next to my downspout. Mm -hmm. And I've taken this plant and divided it so there is a clump of it next to each downspout. <laughs> it's very happy. It's so beautiful and structural. <laughs> they are. They are. Uh, and that and looking at the front of the house again, we can talk about curb appeal. Most of us, as we're gardening, we want to be improving the looks of our home. And there is empirical evidence that the money you spend beautifying, especially the front of your home, is usually returned to you in a 150 to 200% increase in the value of your property. So if you're thinking about selling, it's a great thing to do. If you plant something now, you're thinking five years down the road, you're going to move. You could put small trees in that will look great by then. And then that's a very minimal investment and great for your property value. That's fantastic. Awesome. Do we have what any the, questions? Yes, the name of the plant on the corner like that, that's right by the downspout. What was the name of the plant again? Is it papyrus? Yes, okay. it's papyrus. Cool. What is that uh, ground cover that you have toward the front of your bed there? Oh, that's one of my new favorites. This plant is called frog fruit, Philonotiflora. It is commonly found almost everywhere. If you start looking for it, you'll notice it. It's a native. It grows thick across the ground, no taller than this. It can be mowed. I've met people who have used it as a lawn alternative. If you aren't mowing it, these small flowers attract insects and the little moths and butterflies. Uh, it's fantastic. And it's something that I trialed this year to see how it would be for a green mulch. And I love it. This bed actually. Ah, frog fruits, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Kate um, said uh, frog fruit, AKA turkey tangle. I love yes. that. <laughs> yes. It has a few names. I also heard it called matchstick plant. Well done. So if there aren't any other questions, Tell, tell me a little bit more about how that um, frog fruit um, deals with uh, moisture and um, you know in the need to not uh, mulch. Well, it likes full sun, but it grows well in part shade. And this bed is moist, but I've seen this plant growing in incredibly dry conditions. The thing that I am really in love with is that it has that low, pretty look, kind of almost like the Asian jasmine, which is an invasive exotic, to be frank. And this plant gives back to wildlife. I think it's beautiful. It's providing a green mulch. This bed, I will never mulch this bed again. It's, it's good. I just have to watch for weeds. It holds the weeds down great. And it's also been proven that beds that are planted in kind of natural layers actually hold moisture. Plants kind of support each other. So a bed that is mulched, as opposed to one that's planted thickly like this, will actually take more water. 
That's fantastic. Damien, do we have um, some uh, questions from the chat? Yeah, there's actually one, sure. Um, there's uh, some comments, people are sharing some really good feedback. I like that everyone's helping each other um, with the scientific names, a, a good, good example of why frog fruit, we should use scientific names instead of calling it frog fruits. <laughs> um, but there's a question from Liz and she's asking if there are other plants that attract butterflies and hopefully not bees so much. Um, comment we also got from Debbie was milkweed. Do you know of any others? Milkweed is one. I think there are probably others that are more educated on exactly which plants attract butterflies and not bees. Uh, personally, I don't have any issues with bees, so I haven't needed to kind of parse that out. Yeah, so Lantana, thanks Debbie for that. Lantana plumbago also gets butterflies and not bees. Thanks, Kate. I have had people complain about plumbago and bees before. Now it's just it's anecdotal, but okay. a commercial project where we had planted it near uh, a slide. We we do pool. bees. We, bees are our friends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not by a pool. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Good point. Good point. <laughs> um, bottle brush. I've uh, got another comment. Bottle brush is also a great feeder for birds and butterflies as well. Thank you so much, Debbie, for that. All right. So um, we're about to the end of our um, talk here. And I just wanted to see if uh, Meg wanted to end up, you know, give us a kind of a summation of uh, her talk today. Give us like some parting thoughts. Well, I would just encourage you to call your garden center, get whatever you need, Someone will either deliver it to you or you can do curbside pickup or use mail order. Don't let the fact that we are all confined to be mostly at home keep you from getting out and gardening. It's so good for you. It's great for your property value. It's great for the local flora and fauna. So I hope that you will find a project, get what you need and get out there and put your hands in the dirt. Thank you, Meg. That's fantastic. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to give you some uh, more contact information here about Meg. Once again, Meg Gaffney Cook from Blue Leaf Design. She has a business, Blue Leaf Landscape, um, and you can contact her at meg at blueleaflandscape.com. Thank you, Meg. And, You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, we also want to thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund again for making this program possible. So we're very appreciative of them. And we have another virtual program coming up um, just on the heels of this one in about two weeks, Natural Pest Control with Joshua Rosenberg of Native Jacks. Joshua, who is in our audience today, we're very excited. I just saw him uh, out on the street walking around when I was taking a walk around uh, Five Points earlier today. And he'll be talking about natural pest control, um, plants that you can plant that will um, attract those pests away from the plants that you want and toward the plants that uh, will, uh, you know, hopefully uh, ameliorate uh, those uh, pests. And uh, then he's going to also talk about brewing some compost tea, which I'm very excited to hear more about that. Um, so please join us for that. That's 5.30 p.m. Friday, May 22nd. Also, the St. John's Riverkeeper is holding an event tonight. It's a Facebook live event called the Community Concert for Clean Water. And it uh, will feature the Firewater Tent Revival Band playing at 8 p.m. tonight. Uh, they're inviting you to um, open up a cold local brew, um, order some takeout from a local restaurant and listen to some local music. So I hope all of you will join us tonight at 8 p.m and uh, have a, you know, maybe dance in your living room a little bit. That could be a lot of fun. And then um, we also have a survey that we are putting out and um, want everyone to take. Uh, Damien is going to add that link um, to the chat, but uh, we'll also be sending it out afterward. Uh, we really want you to take this survey so that we can uh, gauge your interest in these programs what other subjects you would like these programs to cover, and uh, the times of day and days of the week that are best for you, that uh, work for your schedule. 
Uh, we will be, we are recording this program, so it will be available on our website later, but uh, we love having these programs in person. It helps um, kind of recreate the magic of our in-person uh, programs. So uh, please let us know what times are good for you. Um, and mostly I wanna thank Meg. I wanna thank all of you for coming. And I wanna thank my co-host, Damian Lamar Robinson. Thanks, Damian. Hey, thank you, Denise. This was super fun. Our first Thanks, time. Thanks, Denise. So way to go. Thank you for putting this together for a great presentation. Meg, thank you so much for the great talk. We love your garden. We love it. Yeah. No, it's been fun. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll be over um, about 6.30 for uh, those grilled vegetables, okay? <laughs> All right, I'll turn it on. I'll get the grill warmed up. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye.